Chapter 17 Vertical Descent Now began our real journey. Hitherto our toil had overcome all difficulties. Now difficulties would spring up at every step. I had not ventured to look down the bottomless pit into which I was about to take a plunge. The supreme hour had come. I might now either share in the enterprise or refuse to move forward, but I was ashamed to recoil in the presence of the hunter. Hans accepted the enterprise with such calmness, such indifference, such perfect disregard of any possible danger, that I blushed at the idea of being less brave than he. If I had been alone, I might have once more tried the effect of argument, but in the presence of the guide I held my peace, my heart flew back to my sweet days, and I approached the central chimney. I have already mentioned that it was a hundred feet in diameter, and three hundred feet round. I bent over a projecting rock and gazed down. My hair stood on end with terror. The bewildering feeling of vacuity laid hold upon me. I felt my centre of gravity shifting its place, and giddiness mounting into my brain like drunkenness. There is nothing more treacherous than this attraction down deep abysses. I was just about to drop down when a hand laid hold of me. It was that of hands. I suppose I had not taken as many lessons on golf exploration as I ought to have done in the Frelseskirk at Copenhagen. But however short was my examination of this well, I had taken some account of its conformation. Its almost perpendicular walls were bristling with innumerable projections, which would facilitate the descent. But if there was no want of steps, still there was no rail. A rope fastened to the edge of the aperture might have helped us down, but how are we to unfasten it when arrived at the other end? My uncle employed a very simple expedient to obviate this difficulty. He uncoiled a cord of the thickness of a finger and four hundred feet long. First he dropped half of it down. Then he passed it round a lava block that projected conveniently and threw the other half down the chimney. Each of us could then descend by holding with the hand both halves of the rope, which would not be able to unroll itself from its hold. When two hundred feet down, it would be easy to get possession of the whole of the rope by letting one end go and pulling down by the other. Then the exercise would go on again, ad infinitum. Now said my uncle, after having completed these preparations. Now let us look to our loads. I will divide them into three lots. Each of us will strap one upon his back. I mean, only fragile articles. Of course, we were not included under that head. Hands, said he, will take charge of the tools and a portion of the provisions. You, Axel, will take another third of the provisions and the arms, and I will take the rest of the provisions and the delicate instruments. But, said I, the clothes and a mass of ladders and ropes. What is to become of them? They will go down by themselves. How so? I asked. You will see presently. My uncle was always willing to employ magnificent resources. Obeying orders, hands tied all the non-fragile articles in one bundle, corded them firmly and sent them bodily down the gulf before us. I listened to the dull thuds of the descending bale. My uncle, leaning over the abyss, followed the descent of the luggage with a satisfied nod, and only rose erect when he had quite lost sight of it. Very well, now it is our turn. Now I ask any sensible man if it was possible to hear those words without a shudder. The professor fastened his package of instruments upon his shoulders, Hans took the tools, I took the arms, and the descent commenced in the following order, Hans, my uncle, and myself. It was effected in profound silence, broken only by the descent of loosened stones down the dark gulf. I dropped it, as it were, frantically clutching the double cord with one hand and buttressing myself from the wall with the other by means of my stick. One idea overpowered me almost, fear lest the rock should give way from which I was hanging. This cord seemed a fragile thing for three persons to be suspended from. I made as little use of it as possible, performing wonderful feats of equilibrium upon the lava projections which my foot seemed to catch hold of like a hand. When one of these slippery steps shook under the heavier form of hands, he said in his tranquil voice, Gif act. Attention! repeated my uncle. In half an hour we were standing upon the surface of a rock jammed in across the chimney from one side to the other. Hands pulled the rope by one of its ends, the other rose in the air. After passing the higher rock it came down again, bringing with it a rather dangerous shower of bits of stone and lava. Leaning over the edge of our narrow standing ground, I observed that the bottom of the hole was still invisible. The same manoeuvre was repeated with the cord, and half an hour after we had descended another two hundred feet. 
I don't suppose the maddest geologist under such circumstances would have studied the nature of the rocks that we were passing. I'm sure I did trouble my head about them. Pliocene, Miocene, Eocene, Cretaceous, Jurassic, Triassic, Permian, Carboniferous, Devonian, Silurian, or Primitive was all one to me. But the professor, no doubt, was pursuing his observations or taking notes, for in one of our halts he said to me, The farther I go, the more confidence I feel. The order of these volcanic formations affords the strongest confirmation to the theories of Davy. We are now among the primitive rocks upon which the chemical operations took place which are produced by the contact of elementary bases of metals with water. I repudiate the notion of central heat altogether. We shall see further proof of that very soon. No variation, always the same conclusion. Of course, I was not inclined to argue. My silence was taken for consent, and the descent went on. Another three hours, and I saw no bottom to the chimney yet. When I lifted my head, I perceived the gradual contraction of its aperture. Its walls, by a gentle incline, were drawing closer to each other, and it was beginning to grow darker. Still, we kept descending. It seemed to me that the falling stones were meeting with an earlier resistance, and that the concussion gave a more abrupt and deadened sound. As I had taken care to keep an exact account of our manoeuvres with the rope, which I knew that we had repeated fourteen times, each descent occupying half an hour, the conclusion was easy that we had been seven hours plus fourteen quarters of rest, making ten hours and a half. We had started at one, it must therefore now be eleven o'clock, and the depth to which we had descended was fourteen times two hundred feet, or two thousand eight hundred feet. At this moment I heard the voice of Hans. Halt! he cried. I stopped short just as I was going to place my feet upon my uncle's head. We are there! he cried. Where? said I, stepping near to him. At the bottom of the perpendicular chimney, he answered. Is there no way farther? Yes, this is a short passage which inclines to the right. We will see about that tomorrow. Let us have our supper and go to sleep. The darkness was not yet complete. The provision case was reopened. We refreshed ourselves and went to sleep, as well as we could upon a bed of stones and lava fragments. When lying on my back, I opened my eyes and saw a bright sparkling point of light at the extremity of the gigantic tube 3,000 feet long, now a vast telescope. It was a star which, seen from this depth, had lost all scintillation, and which, by my computation, should be 46, Ursa Minor. Then I fell fast asleep. Chapter 18 The Wonders of Terrestrial Depths At eight in the morning a ray of daylight came to wake us up. The thousand shining surfaces of lava on the walls received it on its passage, and scattered it like a shower of sparks. There was light enough to distinguish surrounding objects. "'Well, Axel, what do you say to it?' cried my uncle, rubbing his hands. "'Did you ever spend a quieter night in our little house at Königsberg? No noise of cartwheels, no cries of basketwomen, no boatmen shouting?' "'No doubt it is very quiet at the bottom of this well.' but there is something alarming in the quietness itself. Now come, my uncle cried. If you are frightened already, what will you be by and by? We have not gone a single inch yet into the bowels of the earth. W what do you mean? I mean that we have only reached the level of the island, long vertical tube, which terminates at the mouth of the crater, has its lower end only at the level of the sea. Are you sure of that? Quite sure. Consult the barometer. In fact, the mercury, which had risen in the instrument as fast as we descended, had stopped at twenty-nine inches. "'You see,' said the professor, "'we have now only the pressure of our atmosphere, and I shall be glad when the aneroid takes the place of the barometer. And in truth, this instrument would become useless as soon as the weight of the atmosphere should exceed the pressure ascertained at the level of the sea.' "'But,' I said, "'is there not reason to fear that this ever-increasing pressure will become at last very painful to bear?' No, we shall descend at a slow rate, and our lungs will become inured to a denser atmosphere. Aeronauts find the want of air as they rise to high elevations, but we shall perhaps have too much. Of the two, this is what I should prefer. Don't let us lose a moment. Where is the bundle we sent down before us? I then remembered that we had searched for it in vain the evening before. My uncle questioned Hans, who, after having examined attentively with the eye of a huntsman, replied, Der Hooper. Up there! And so it was. The bundle had been caught by a projection a hundred feet above us, 
Immediately, the Icelander climbed up like a cat, and in a few minutes the package was in our possession. Now, said my uncle, let us breakfast, but we must lay in a good stock, for we don't know how long we may have to go on. The biscuit and extract of meat were washed down with a draught of water mingled with a little gin. Breakfast over, my uncle drew from his pocket a small notebook intended for scientific observations. He consulted his instruments and recorded. Monday, July 1st. Chronometer, 8.17am. Barometer, 29.7 inches. Thermometer, 6 degrees, 43 degrees Fahrenheit. Direction, east-south-east. The last observation applied to the dark gallery and was indicated by the compass. Now, Axel, cried the professor with enthusiasm, now we are really going into the interior of the earth. At this precise moment, the journey commences. So saying, my uncle took in one hand Rumkorf's apparatus, which was hanging from his neck, and with the other he formed an electric communication with the coil in the lantern, and a sufficiently bright light dispersed the darkness of the passage. Hans carried the other apparatus, which was also put into action. This ingenious application of electricity would enable us to go on for a long time by creating an artificial light even in the midst of the most inflammable gases. Now march, cried my uncle. Each shouldered his package, hands drove before him the load of cords and clothes, and myself, walking last, we entered the gallery. At the moment of becoming engulfed in this dark gallery, I raised my head and saw for the last time through the length of that vast tube the sky of Iceland, which I was never to behold again. The lava, in the last eruption of 1229, had forced a passage through this tunnel. It still lined the walls with a thick and glistening coat. The electric light was here intensified a hundredfold by reflection. The only difficulty in proceeding lay in not sliding too fast down an incline of about 45 degrees. Happily, certain asperities and a few blisterings here and there formed steps, and we descended, letting our baggage slip before us from the end of a long rope. But that which formed steps under our feet became stalactites overhead. The lava, which was porous in many places, had formed a surface covered with small rounded blisters, crystals of opaque quartz set with limpid tiers of glass and hanging like clustered chandeliers from the vaulted roof, seemed as it were to kindle and form a sudden illumination as we passed on our way. It seemed as if the genie of the depths were lighting up the place to receive their terrestrial guests. It is magnificent, I cried spontaneously. My uncle, what a sight! Don't you admire those blending hues of lava, passing from reddish brown to bright yellow by imperceptible shades? And these crystals are just like globes of light. Ah, you think so, do you, Axel, my boy? Well, you will see greater splendours than these, I hope. Now let us march. March! He had better have said slide, for we did nothing but drop down the steep inclines. It was the Faculis Descensus Averni of Virgil. The compass which I consulted frequently gave our direction as southeast with inflexible steadiness. This lava stream deviated neither to the right nor to the left. Yet there was no sensible increase of temperature. This justified Davy's theory, and more than once I consulted the thermometer with surprise. Two hours after our departure, it only marked 10 degrees, 50 degrees Fahrenheit, an increase of only 4 degrees. This gave reason for believing that our descent was more horizontal than vertical. As for the exact depth reached, it was very easy to ascertain that. The professor measured accurately the angles of deviation and inclination on the road, but he kept the results to himself. About eight in the evening, he signalled to stop. Hans sat down at once. The lamps were hung upon a projection in the lava. We were in a sort of cavern where there was plenty of air. Certain puffs of air reached us. What atmospheric disturbance was the cause of them? I could not answer that question at the moment. Hunger and fatigue made me incapable of reasoning. A descent of seven hours consecutively is not made without considerable expenditure of strength. I was exhausted. The order to halt therefore gave me pleasure. Hans laid our provisions upon a block of lava, and we ate with a good appetite. But one thing troubled me. Our supply of water was half consumed. My uncle reckoned upon a fresh supply from subterranean sources, but hitherto we had met with none. I could not help drawing his attention to this circumstance. Are you surprised at the want of springs? he said. More than that, I am anxious about it. We have only water enough for five days. Don't be uneasy, Axel. We shall find more than we want. When? When we have left this bed of lava behind us, how could springs break through such walls as these? But perhaps this passage runs to a very great depth. 
It seems to me that we have made no great progress vertically. Why do you suppose that? Because if we had gone deep into the crust of the earth, we should have encountered greater heat. According to your system, said my uncle, but what does the thermometer say? Hardly 15 degrees, 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Nine degrees only since our departure. Well, what is your conclusion? This is my conclusion. According to exact observations, the increase of temperature in the interior of the globe advances at the rate of one degree, one and four-fifths degree Fahrenheit, for every hundred feet. But certain local conditions may modify this rate. Thus at Yakutsk in Siberia, the increase of a degree is ascertained to be reached every 36 feet. The difference depends upon the heat-conducting power of the rocks. Moreover, in the neighbourhood of an extinct volcano, through Nice, it has been observed that the increase of a degree is only attained every 125 feet. Let us therefore assume this last hypothesis is the most suitable to our situation and calculate. Well, do calculate, my boy. Nothing is easier, said I, putting down figures in my notebook. Nine times 125 feet gives a depth of 1125 feet. Very accurate indeed. Well, by my observation, we are at 10,000 feet below the level of the sea. Is that possible? Yes, all figures are of no use. The professor's calculations were quite correct. We had already attained a depth of 6,000 feet beyond that hitherto reached by the foot of man, such as the mines of Kitzbühel in Tyrol and those of Württemberg in Bohemia. The temperature, which ought to have been 81 degrees, 178 degrees Fahrenheit, was scarcely 15 degrees, 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Here was cause for reflection. Chapter 19. Geological Studies in Situ Next day, Tuesday, June 30th, at 6am, the descent began again. We were still following the gallery of lava, a real natural staircase, and as gently sloping as those inclined planes which in some old houses are still found instead of flights of steps. And so we went on until 12.17, the precise moment when we overtook Hans, who had stopped. Ah, here we are, exclaimed my uncle. At the very end of the chimney. I looked around me. We were standing at the intersection of two roads, both dark and narrow. Which were we to take? This was a difficulty. Still, my uncle refused to admit an appearance of hesitation, either before me or the guide. He pointed out the eastern tunnel, and we were soon all three in it. Besides, there would have been interminable hesitation before this choice of roads, for since there was no indication whatever to guide our choice, we were obliged to trust to chance. The slope of this gallery was scarcely perceptible, and its sections very unequal. Sometimes we passed a series of arches succeeding each other like the majestic arcades of a Gothic cathedral. Here the architects of the Middle Ages might have found studies for every form of the sacred art which sprang from the development of the pointed arch. And a mile farther we had to bow our heads under corniced elliptic arches in the Romanesque style, and massive pillars standing out from the wall bent under the spring of the vault that rested heavily upon them. In other places this magnificence gave way to narrow channels between low structures which looked like beavers' huts, and we had to creep along through extremely narrow passages. The heat was perfectly bearable. Involuntarily I began to think of its heat when the lava thrown out by Snaefell was boiling and working through this now silent road. I imagined the torrents of fire hurled back at every angle in the gallery, and the accumulation of intensely heated vapours in the midst of this confined channel. I only hope, thought I, that this so-called extinct volcano won't take a fancy in his old age to begin his sports again. I abstained from communicating these fears to Professor Liedenbrock. He would never have understood them at all. He had but one idea, forward. He walked, he slid, he scrambled, he tumbled with a persistency which one could not but admire. By six in the evening, after a not very fatiguing walk, we had gone two leagues south, but scarcely a quarter of a mile down. My uncle said it was time to go to sleep. We ate without talking and went to sleep without reflection. Our arrangements for the night were very simple. A railway rug each, into which we rolled ourselves, was our sole covering. We had neither cold nor intrusive visits to fear. Travellers who penetrate into the wilds of central Africa and into the pathless forests of the New World are obliged to watch over each other by night. But we enjoyed absolute safety and utter seclusion. No savages or wild beasts infected these silent depths. 
Next morning, we awoke fresh and in good spirits. The road was resumed. As the day before, we followed the path of the lava. It was impossible to tell what rocks we were passing. The tunnel, instead of tending lower, approached more and more nearly to a horizontal direction. I even fancied a slight rise. But about ten, this upward tendency became so evident, and therefore so fatiguing, that I was obliged to slacken my pace. Well, Axel? demanded the professor impatiently. Well, I cannot stand it any longer, I replied. What? After three hours' walk over such easy ground? It may be easy, but it is tiring all the same. What, when we have nothing to do but keep going down? Going up, if you please. Going up? said my uncle, with a shrug. No doubt, for the last half hour the inclines have gone the other way, and at this rate we shall soon arrive upon the level soil of Iceland. The professor nodded slowly and uneasily, like a man that declines to be convinced. I tried to resume the conversation. He answered not a word, and gave the signal for a start. I saw that his silence was nothing but ill humour. Still, I had courageously shouldered my burden again, and was rapidly following Hans, whom my uncle preceded. I was anxious not to be left behind. My greatest care was not to lose sight of my companions. I shuddered at the thought of being lost in the mazes of this vast subterranean labyrinth. Besides, if the ascending road did become steeper, I was comforted with the thought that it was bringing us nearer to the surface. There was hope in this. Every step confirmed me in it, and I was rejoicing at the thought of meeting my little Grauben again. By midday there was a change in the appearance of this wall of the gallery. I noticed it by a diminution of the amount of light reflected from the sides. Solid rock was appearing in the place of the lava coating. The mass was composed of inclined and sometimes vertical strata. We were passing through rocks of the transition or Silurian system. It is evident, I cried. The marine deposits formed in the second period, these shales, limestones and sandstones. We are turning away from the primary granite. We are just as if we were people of Hamburg, going to Lerbeck by way of Hanover. I had better have kept my observations to myself, but my geological instinct was stronger than my prudence, and Uncle Liedenbrock heard my exclamation. What's that you are saying? he asked. See, I said, pointing to the varied series of sandstones and limestones, and the first indication of slate. Well? We are at the period when the first plants and animals appeared. Do you think so? Look close and examine. I obliged the professor to move his lamp over the walls of the gallery. I expected some signs of astonishment, but he spoke not a word, and went on. Had he understood me or not? Did he refuse to admit, out of self-love as an uncle and a philosopher, that he had mistaken his way when he chose the eastern tunnel? Or was he determined to examine this passage to its farthest extremity? It was evident that we had left the lava path, and that this road could not possibly lead to the extinct furnace of Snaefell. Yet I asked myself if I was not depending too much on this change in the rock. Might I not myself be mistaken? Were we really crossing the layers of rock which overlie the granite foundation? If I am right, I thought, I must soon find some fossil remains of primitive life, and then we must yield to evidence. I will look. I had not gone a hundred paces before incontestable proofs presented themselves. It could not be otherwise, for in the Silurian age the seas contained at least fifteen hundred vegetable and animal species. My feet, which had become accustomed to the indurated lava floor, suddenly rested upon a dust composed of the debris of plants and shells. In the walls were distinct impressions of fucoids and lycopodites. Professor Liedenbrock could not be mistaken. I thought, and yet he pushed on, with, I suppose, his eyes resolutely shut. This was only invincible obstinacy. I could hold out no longer. I picked up a perfectly formed shell, which had belonged to an animal not unlike the woodlouse. Then, joining my uncle, I said, Look at this. Very well, said he quietly. It is the shell of a crustacean, of an extinct species called a trilobite. Nothing more. But don't you conclude... Just what you conclude yourself, yes I do perfectly, we have left the granite and the lava, it is possible that I may be mistaken, but I cannot be sure of that until I have reached the very end of this gallery. You are right in doing this, my uncle, and I should quite approve of your determination, if there were not a danger threatening us nearer and nearer. What danger? The want of water. Well, Axel, we will put ourselves upon rations. Chapter 20 the first signs of distress. In fact, we had to ration ourselves. Our provision of water could not last more than three days. I found that out for certain when supper time came. 
and to our sorrow we had little reason to expect to find a spring in these transition beds. The whole of the next day the gallery opened before us its endless arcades. We moved on almost without a word. Hans's silence seemed to be infecting us. The road was now not ascending, at least not perceptibly. Sometimes even it seemed to have a slight fall, but this tendency, which was very trifling, could not do anything to reassure the professor, for there was no change in the beds, and the transitional characteristics became more and more decided. The electric light was reflected in sparkling splendour from the schist, limestone and old red sandstone of the walls. It might have been thought that we were passing through a section of Wales, of which an ancient people gave its name to the system. Specimens of magnificent marbles clothed the walls, some of greyish agate, fantastically veined with white, others of rich crimson or yellow dashed with splotches of red. Then came dark cherry-coloured marbles, relieved by the lighter tints of limestone. The greater part of these bore impressions of primitive organisms. Creation had evidently advanced since the day before. Instead of rudimentary trilobites, I noticed remains of a more perfect order of beings, amongst others, ganoid fishes and some of these sauroids in which paleontologists have discovered the earliest reptile forms. The Devonian seas were peopled by animals of these species, and deposited them by thousands in the rocks of the newer formation. It was evident that we were ascending the scale of animal life in which man fills the highest place, but Professor Liedenbrock seemed not to notice it. He was awaiting one of two events, either the appearance of a vertical well opening before his feet, down which our descent might be resumed, or that of some obstacle which should effectively turn us back on our own footsteps. But evening came, and neither wish was gratified. On Friday, after a night during which I felt pangs of thirst, our little troop again plunged into the winding passages of the gallery. After ten hours walking, I observed a singular deadening of the reflection of our lamps from the side walls. The marble, the schist, the limestone and the sandstone were giving way to a dark and lustreless lining. At one moment, the tunnel became very narrow. I leaned against the wall. When I removed my hand, it was black. I looked nearer and found we were in a coal formation. Coal mine, I cried. A mine without miners, my uncle replied. Who knows, I asked. I know, the professor pronounced decidedly. I am certain that this gallery driven through beds of coal was never pierced by the hand of man, but whether it be the hand of nature or not does not matter. Supper time is come. Let us sup. Hans prepared some food. I scarcely ate, and I swallowed down the few drops of water rationed out to me. One flask half full was all we had left to slake the thirst of three men. After their meal, my two companions laid themselves down upon their rugs, and found in sleep a solace for their fatigue but I could not sleep, and I counted every hour until morning. On Saturday at six, we started afresh. In twenty minutes, we reached a vast open space. I then knew that the hand of man had not hollowed out this mine. The vaults would have been shored up, and as it was, they seemed to be held up by a miracle of equilibrium. This cavern was about a hundred feet wide and a hundred and fifty in height. A large mass had been rent asunder by a subterranean disturbance, yielding to some vast power from below it, had broken asunder, leaving this great hollow into which human beings were now penetrating for the first time. The whole history of the Carboniferous period was written upon these gloomy walls, and a geologist might with ease trace all its diverse phases. The beds of coal were separated by strata of sandstone or compact clays, and appeared crushed under the weight of overlying strata. At the age of the world which preceded the secondary period, the earth was clothed with immense vegetable forms, the product of the double influence of tropical heat and constant moisture, a vapoury atmosphere surrounded the earth, still veiling the direct rays of the sun. Thence arises the conclusion that the high temperatures then existing was due to some other source than the heat of the sun. Perhaps even the orb of day may not have been ready yet to play the splendid part he now acts. There were no climates as yet, and a torrid heat equal from pole to equator was spread over the whole surface of the globe. Whence this heat? Was it from the interior of the earth? Notwithstanding the theories of Professor Liedenbrock, a violent heat did at that time brood within the body of the spheroid. Its action was felt to the very last coats of the terrestrial crust. The plants, unacquainted with the beneficent influences of the sun, yielded neither flowers nor scent, but their roots drew vigorous life from the burning soil of the early days of this planet. There were but few trees. Herbaceous plants alone existed. There were tall grasses, ferns, lycopods, besides sigillaria, astrophyllites, now scarce plants, but then the species might be counted by thousands. 
The coal measures owe their origin to this period of profuse vegetation. The yet elastic and yielding crust of the earth obeyed the fluid forces beneath, thence innumerable fissures and depressions. The plants sunk underneath the waters formed by degrees into vast accumulated masses. Then came the chemical action of nature. In the depths of the seas, the vegetable accumulations first became peat, then, acted upon by generated gases and the heat of fermentation, they underwent a process of complete mineralization. Thus were formed those immense coal fields, which nevertheless are not inexhaustible, and which three centuries at the present accelerated rate of consumption will exhaust unless the industrial world will devise a remedy. These reflections came into my mind whilst I was contemplating the mineral wealth stored up in this portion of the globe. These, no doubt, I thought, will never be discovered. The working of such deep mines would involve too large an outlay, and where would be the use as long as coal is yet spread far and wide near the surface? Such as my eyes behold these virgin stores, such they will be when this world comes to an end. But still we marched on, and I alone was forgetting the length of the way by losing myself in the midst of geological contemplations. The temperature remained what it had been during our passage through the lava and schists. Only my sense of smell was forcibly affected by an odour of proto of hydrogen. I immediately recognised in this gallery the presence of a considerable quantity of the dangerous gas called by miners fire damp, the explosion of which has often occasioned such dreadful catastrophes. Happily, our light was from Rumkoff's ingenious apparatus. If unfortunately we had explored this gallery with torches, a terrible explosion would have put an end to travelling and travellers at one stroke. This excursion through the coal mine lasted till night. My uncle scarcely could restrain his impatience at the horizontal road. The darkness, always deep twenty yards before us, prevented us from estimating the length of the gallery, and I was beginning to think it must be endless, when suddenly at six o'clock a wall very unexpectedly stood right before us. Right or left, top or bottom, there was no road farther. We were at the end of a blind alley. Very well, it's all right, cried my uncle. Now, at any rate, we shall know what we are about. We are not in Sacrosum's road, and all we have to do is go back. Let us take a night's rest, and in three days we shall get to the fork in the road. Yes, said I, if we have any strength left. Why not? Because tomorrow we shall have no water. Nor courage either, asked my uncle severely. I dared make no answer. Chapter 21. Compassion Fuses the Professor's Heart Next day we started early. We had to hasten forward. It was a three days march to the crossroads. I will not speak of the sufferings we endured in our return. My uncle bore them with the angry impatience of a man obliged to own his weakness, hands with the resignation of his passive nature. I, I confess, with complaints and expressions of despair, I had no spirit to oppose this ill fortune. As I had foretold, the water failed entirely by the end of the first day's retrograde march. Our fluid aliment was now nothing but gin, but this infernal fluid burned my throat, and I could not even endure the sight of it. I found the temperature and the air stifling. Fatigue paralysed my limbs. More than once I dropped down motionless. Then there was a halt, and my uncle and the Icelander did their best to restore me but I saw that the former was struggling painfully against excessive fatigue and the tortures of thirst. At last, on Tuesday, July 8th, we arrived on our hands and knees and half dead at the junction of the two roads. There I dropped like a lifeless lump, extended on the lava soil. It was ten in the morning. Hans and my uncle, clinging to the wall, tried to nibble a few bits of biscuit. Long moans escaped from my swollen lips. After some time, my uncle approached me and raised me in his arms. Poor boy, said he, in genuine tones of compassion. I was touched with these words, not being accustomed to see the excitable professor in a softened mood. I grasped his trembling hands in mine. He let me hold them and looked at me. His eyes were moistened. Then I saw him take the flask that was hanging at his side. To my amazement, he placed it on my lips. Drink, said he. Had I heard him? Was my uncle beside himself? I stared at him stupidly and felt as if I could not understand him. Drink, he said again. And raising his flask, he emptied every drop between my lips. Oh, infinite pleasure, a slender sip of water came to moisten my burning mouth. 
It was but one sip, but it was enough to recall my ebbing life. I thanked my uncle with clasped hands. Yes, he said. A draught of water, but it is the very last you hear, the last. I had kept it as precious treasure at the bottom of my flask. Twenty times, nay a hundred times, have I fought against a frightful impulse to drink it off. But no, Axel, I kept it for you. My dear uncle, I said, whilst hot tears trickled down my face. Yes, my poor boy, I knew that as soon as you arrived at these crossroads you would drop half dead, and I kept my last drop of water to reanimate you. Thank you, thank you, I said. Although my thirst was only partially quenched, yet some strength had returned. The muscles of my throat, until then contracted, now relaxed again, and the inflammation of my lips abated somewhat, as I was now able to speak. Let us see, I said. We have now but one thing to do. We have no water. We must go back. While I spoke, my uncle avoided looking at me. He hung his head down. His eyes avoided mine. We must return, I exclaimed vehemently. We must go back on our way to Snaefell. May God give us strength to climb up the crater again. Return? said my uncle, as if he was rather answering himself than me. Yes, return without the loss of a minute. A long silence followed. So then, Axel, replied the professor ironically, you have found no courage or energy in these few drops of water. Courage? I see you just as feeble-minded as you were before, and still expressing only despair. What sort of man was this I had to do with, and what schemes was he now revolving in his fearless mind? What, you won't go back? Should I renounce this expedition just when we have the fairest chance of success? Never! Then we must resign ourselves to destruction? No, Axel, no. Go back. Hans will go with you. Leave me to myself. Leave you here? Leave me, I tell you. I have undertaken this expedition. I will carry it out to the end, and I will not return. Go, Axel, go. My uncle was in a state of excitement. His voice, which had for a moment been tender and gentle, had now become hard and threatening. He was struggling with gloomy resolutions against impossibilities. I would not leave him in this bottomless abyss, and on the other hand, the instinct of self-preservation prompted me to fly. The guide watched this scene with his usual phlegmatic unconcern, yet he understood perfectly well what was going on between his two companions. The gestures themselves were sufficient to show that we were each bent on taking a different road, but Hans seemed to take no part in a question upon which depended his life. He was ready to start at a given signal, or to stay, if his master so willed it. How I wished at this moment I could have made him understand me. My words, my complaints, my sorrow would have had some influence over that frigid nature. Those dangers which our guide could not understand I could have demonstrated and proved to him. Together we might have overruled the obstinate professor. If it were needed, we might perhaps have compelled him to regain the heights of Snaefell. I drew near to Hans. I placed my hand upon his. He made no movement. My parted lips sufficiently revealed my sufferings. The Icelander slowly moved his head, and calmly pointing to my uncle, said, Master. Master, I shouted. You madman. No, he is not the master of our life. We must fly. We must drag him. Do you hear me? Do you understand? I had seized hands by the arm. I wished to oblige him to rise. I strove with him. My uncle interposed. Be calm, Axel. You will get nothing from that immovable servant. Therefore, listen to my proposal. I crossed my arms and confronted my uncle boldly. The want of water, he said, is the only obstacle in our way. In this eastern gallery made up of lavas, schists and coal, we have not met with a single particle of moisture. Perhaps we shall be more fortunate if we follow the western tunnel. I shook my head incredulously. Hear me to the end, the professor went on with a firm voice. Whilst you were lying there motionless, I went to examine the conformation of that gallery. It penetrates directly downward, and in a few hours it will bring us to the granite rocks. There we must meet with abundant springs. The nature of the rock assures me of this, and instinct agrees with logic to support my conviction. Now, this is my proposal. When Columbus asked of his ship's crews for three days more to discover a new world, those crews, disheartened and sick as they were, recognized the justice of the claim, and he discovered America. I am the Columbus of this netherworld, and I only ask for one more day. If in a single day I have not met with the water that we want, I swear to you we will return to the surface of the earth. 
In spite of my irritation, I was moved with these words, as well as with the violence my uncle was doing to his own wishes in making so hazardous a proposal. Well, I said, do as you will, and God reward your superhuman energy. You have now but a few hours to tempt fortune. Let us start.'